However, with regard to the two remaining charges that are alleged against my client, I do see the fountainhead. I see the certain author and originator. Gold was wanted. He received it from Clodia. He received it without any witness. He had it as long as he wanted. Well, here I see evidence of some extraordinary intimacy between them. It's then alleged that he wanted to kill her, that he sought for poison, that he tampered with someone's slaves, that he arranged it, he prepared a place, and he brought it. I deduce here that some violent quarrel has sprung up between them, engendering a furious hatred. Our whole business in this part of the case, O oh judges, is with Clodia, a woman of not only nobility but even notoriety, a woman about whom I will say nothing except for the sake of repelling any accusation of a crime. But you certainly are aware, through your eminent wisdom, Gaius Domitian, that in this matter we ought to deal with her alone. For if she does not say that she lent the money to Caelius, if she does not accuse him and say the poison was prepared for her by him, then we are acting wantonly and groundlessly by mentioning the name of a mother of a Roman family in a way so different from what is due to a Roman matron. But if you were just to remove that woman from this case, then there is no longer any charge against my client, nor do the accusers have any resources by which to attack him. What then is my duty as the advocate of his cause except to repel those who pursue him? And still I would do so much more vigorously had I not a quarrel with that woman's husband. Brother, brother, I meant to say. I'm constantly making that mistake. Nevertheless, at present I will proceed with moderation and I will go no further than my duty to my client in the nature of this case compels me. For I've never thought it in my duty to engage in quarrels with any woman, especially with one whom all men consider to be everyone's friend rather than anyone's enemy. Nevertheless, I would ask her first herself whether she wishes me to deal with her strictly and gravely in the manner of our forefathers or more indulgently, mercifully, and courteously. For if I am to proceed in the old-fashioned manner of cross-examination, then I must summon up from the depths one of those old bearded men, not men with those little imperial goatees to which she takes such a fancy, but he with that long shaggy beard, such as you all see on our ancient statues and images. Let him reproach the woman, and speak in my place, lest she by any chance might become angry with me. Let then one of her own family line rise up, and above all others, let it be that great, blind Claudius of old. For he will feel the least grief, inasmuch as he can't see her. He who certainly, if he were living, would deal with her thus. Woman, what hast thou with Caelius? What with such a young man? What with another's husband? Why have you been so intimate with him as to lend him your gold, or so much his enemy as to fear his poison? Have you not seen that your father, your grandfather, your uncle, your great-grandfather, your twice-great-grandfather, your thrice-great-grandfather, haven't you heard they were all consuls? Did you not know at length that you were bound in wedlock to Quintus Metellus, a most illustrious and gallant man and most devoted to his country? He who, from the very moment that he raised his foot from his threshold, was instantly surpassing all men in manners of virtue, glory, and dignity. When you had become his wife, and being from a most illustrious race yourself, having married into a most renowned family, why then was Caelius so intimate with you? Was he a relation, a business connection? Was he a friend of your husband's? Nothing of the sort. What then was the reason except for some lustful folly? Surely, even if the images of us, the men of your family line, have no influence over you, didn't my own daughter, that celebrated Quintia Claudia, admonish you to at least emulate the praise belonging to our house from the glory of its women? 
Didn't the vestal virgin Claudia recur to your mind? She who embraced her father while celebrating his triumph and prevented his being dragged from his chariot by a hostile tribune of the plebs? Why did your brother's vices have more sway with you than the virtues of your father, your grandfathers, and others in regular descent ever since my own time? Virtues exemplified repeatedly not only in the men but the women. Is this why I broke the treaty with Pyrrhus, that you should every day make new treaties of your most disgraceful lust? Is this why I built an aqueduct, that you should use its water to wash away your impious sins? Is this why I built a highway, that you should walk the street, escorted by other women's husbands? But why, O oh judges, have I brought such a grave persona onto this scene, as to make me fear that the same man might suddenly turn round and begin to reprimand my client with the severity of a censor? But I will look to this presently, and I will discuss it at length, O oh judges, so that I feel certain I shall show even the most rigid scrutinizers reason to approve of the habits and life of Marcus Caelius. But as for you, woman, for now I speak to you myself, without the intervention of any imaginary character, if you think you can make us approve of what you are doing, and what you are saying, what you are planning, and what you are charging him with, and what you are seeking to achieve by this prosecution, then you must give an intelligible and satisfactory account of your great familiarity, your intimate connection, your extraordinary union with him. For the accusers have mentioned things like lusts, adulteries, orgies on the seashore at banquets, revelries, concerts and festivals and boat cruises, and in doing so they also imply they do not mention any of these topics without your consent. And as for you, since through some unbridled and headlong fury which I cannot yet comprehend, since you've chosen for these things to be brought up in court and dilated upon at this trial, then you must either efface these charges yourself and show they are without any foundation, or else you must confess that no credit is to be given to any accusations which you make or to any evidence which you give. But if you wish me to act more urbanely with you, I will deal with you thus. I will put away that strict and boorish old man, and out of these kinsmen of yours here present I will pick someone, and before all I will select your youngest brother, who is one of the most urbane men of his class, who is also exceedingly fond of you, and who, on account of some childish timidity, I suppose, and some groundless fears of what could happen by night, has, ever since he was but a little boy, occasionally slept with you, his eldest sister. I suppose, then, he would speak to you in such a way. What is it that disturbs you, sister? Why are you so mad? Why thus with outcry loud do you exalt such trifles into things of consequence? You saw a young man become your neighbor. His fair complexion, his height, and his countenance made an impression on you. You wished to see him more often. You were occasionally seen in the same gardens with him, but being a woman of high rank, you were unable with all your riches to detain him the son of a thrifty and parsimonious father. He kicks you, he rejects you. He does not think your presence worth so much as you require of him. So try someone else. You have gardens on the Tiber, most carefully placed in the particular spot to which all the youth of the city are come to bathe. Every day you may pick out new people to suit you. Why thus annoy this one who scorns you? Ugh. And now I come to you, O Caelius, in your turn. I take upon myself the authority and strictness of a father, but I doubt which father figure I shall select to assume. Shall I play the part of one of Caecilius's fathers, harsh and vehement? Now already at length my bosom burns, already my heart is ravaged by rage or perhaps some other character. O oh, thou happy, unhappy, worthless son! Iron-hearted are such parents as who bear thee. What could I possibly say? What wishes dare I make? 
when all your base actions make it so I want only nothing. Such a father as that would say things you could scarcely endure, Kylie's. He would say, why did you take yourself to the neighborhood of a harlot? Why did you not shun her notorious blandishments? Why did you ever have any sort of relationship with that woman? Squander your money, throw it away, I give you leave. If you will go, it is you who will suffer for it, not I. I shall be satisfied if I am able to spend pleasantly the small portion of my life that remains to me. And to such a morose and severe old man, Caelius would respond that he had not departed from the right path, having been led astray by any passion. What proof could he give? That he had been at no expense and no loss, that he had not borrowed any money, but it's alleged that he had. Well, how few people are there who can avoid such a report in a city so prone to rumor? Are you at all surprised that the neighbor of that woman was spoken of unfavorably when even her own brother couldn't escape being made the subject of some controversy? Yet for a gentle, kind, and considerate father such as Caelius's, his language would most certainly be. Has he broken the doors? They shall be mended. Has he torn his shirt? It shall be fixed. Thus, the case of Caelius is most easily explicated. For what circumstances could there be in which he could not easily defend himself? And here I will say nothing of that woman, but if there were a woman totally unlike her, who had made herself common to everybody, who always had someone or other openly avowed as her lover, whose gardens, house, and whose baths the lusts of every one had free access to of their own right, a woman who kept even young men and made up for the parsimony of their fathers by her excessive liberality. If she lived, being a widow with freedom, being a lascivious woman with wantonness, being a rich woman extravagantly, and being a lustful woman in the manner of a prostitute, then am I to consider any man an adulterer who might happen to salute her with a little too much freedom? Someone here certainly will demand of me. Is this then the discipline which you enforce? Is this the way you train up young men? Was this the object to which a parent delivered his son to you, that he might devote his entire youth to pleasures and lusts, so that you might later defend this manner of life and these pursuits in court? If, O oh judges, there were any man among us with such vigor of mind and of a natural disposition so formed for such virtue and continence as to reject all pleasures and to dedicate the whole course of his life to the labor of his body and to the wholesome training of his mind, a man who takes no delight in rest or relaxation or the pursuits of those of his own age or games or banquets and who thinks nothing in life is worth desiring except that which is connected with glory and with dignity. That man I do consider to be furnished and endowed with qualities which may be rightly considered divine. To this class of men I surmount belonged those great men of old, the Camilli, the Fabrici, the Curi, and all those who had achieved such mighty exploits with such inadequate means. Truly, examples of such stoic virtue aren't only lacking in our own age, but they occur so rarely, even in books. The very records which used to contain the accounts of the old-fashioned strictness of morals are now worn out. And they're not only non-existent among us who have adopted this school and system of life, more so in reality than in words, but not even among the Greeks, those most learned men, who, although they couldn't live in such a manner, they were nevertheless at liberty to speak and to write most honorably and magnificently. But when the habits of Greece became changed, other precepts arose and prevailed in time. Therefore, some of their wisest men said that they once did everything only for the sake of pleasure, and even learned men were not ashamed of any degradation of uttering such a sentiment. Others thought the concept of dignity ought to be wholly united with pleasure, such as the neatness of Greek expression, to unite things as inconsistent with one another as possible. 
Yet those who still hold that the only direct path to glory is combined with toil, they are now left almost solitary in their schools. For nature herself has supplied us with numerous allurements by which virtue may be lulled to sleep, and at which she may indu be induced to connive. Nature herself frequently points out to youth the many slippery ways on which it is hardly possible to stand, along which one can hardly advance a single step without some slip or downfall. And she's also supplied an infinite variety of exquisite delights, by which not only that tender age, but even one which is more strongly fortified, might be captivated. Therefore, if by chance you find any one whose eyes are so well tutored as to look with scorn on the outward beauty of things, any one who is not captivated by some fragrance or touch or flavor and who stops his ears against the allurements of music, I and perhaps a few others may think that the gods have been prosperous to this man, but most people will consider he's been treated as an object of their anger. Nevertheless, there have been, O oh judges, both within our own recollection and in the time of our fathers and ancestors, very many most excellent men and most illustrious citizens, who, after their youthful passions had cooled down, they displayed, when they became of a more mature and vigorous age, the most exalted virtues, of whom there is no need for me to name to you any particular individual, as you yourselves, I'm sure, can recollect plenty. Nor do I wish to connect even the slightest air on my own part to any brave and illustrious man's greatest achievements. But if I did choose to do so, then I would name many most eminent and distinguished men, some of whom were also known for excessive licentiousness in their early days, some for their profuse luxury, their enormous debt, their extravagance, and their debauchery. But whose early heirs were afterwards so painted over by their numerous virtues that everyone felt at liberty to make excuses for and to defend their youth. But truly within Marcus Caelius, for I will now speak even more confidently about his honorable pursuits, because, relying on your wisdom, O oh judges, I am not afraid to freely confess such things respecting him. No such luxury will be found, no extravagance, no debt, no lasciviousness, no devotion to banquets or to gluttony. Those vices I speak of of the belly and the throat, age is so far from diminishing in men that it even increases them. And amores and those things which are called delights, which, when men have any strength of mind, they are not usually troublesome to them for any great length of time, for they do wear off early and very rapidly. They never had any firm hold on this man so as to entangle or to embarrass him. You've heard him when he was speaking on his own behalf, and you've heard him previously acting as prosecutor. I say this now for the sake of defending him, not for boasting. You have seen. Your wisdom could not help but to have seen his style of eloquence, his faculty, his richness of ideas and of language. And in that branch of study you saw not only his genius shine forth, which frequently, even when it is not properly nourished by industry, still produces very great effects even by its own natural vigor, but there was in him, unless I am greatly deceived by reason of my favorable inclination towards him, a degree of method implanted in him by his liberal tastes, and worked up by all that care and hard labor. And know this, O oh judges, that the passions which are now brought up against my client as an objection to him, and these studies on which I am presently enlarging, they cannot easily exist in the same body. For a mental faculty which is devoted to lust, hampered by love, by desire, by passion, or even perhaps by overindulgence and by embarrassment in pecuniary matters, it could never support the labors such as they are when we go through in oratory, not merely when actually speaking, but even when thinking. Do you suppose there is any other reason why, when the prizes of eloquence are so great, when the pleasure of speaking is so great, when the glory is so high, the influence derived from it so extensive and the honor so pure, that there would, there would be and always shall be so few men who devote themselves to this study. 
For all pleasure must be trampled underfoot. All pursuit of amusement must be abandoned, O oh, judges. Sports and jesting and feasting. Yes, I might almost say, even the company of one's friends must be shunned. And this is what deters men of his class from the labors and studies of oratory. Not that their abilities are deficient or that their early training has been neglected. Would Caelius, if he had given himself up to such a life while still such a young man, would he have instituted a prosecution against a man of consular rank? Would he, if he shunned the labor, if he were captivated by and entangled in the pursuit of pleasure, would he take his place daily among this array of orators? Would he court enmities? Would he undertake prosecutions? Would he incur danger to his life? Would he, in the sight of all the Roman people, struggle for so many months for safety or for glory? But if there be any one who thinks that youth is to be wholly indicted from rendezvous with prostitutes, he certainly is very strict indeed. I cannot deny what he says, but still he is at odds not only with the general license of the present age, but even with the habits of our ancestors and with what they used to consider allowable. For when was the time that men were not accustomed to act in this manner? When was such conduct found fault with? When was it not permitted? When, in short, was the time that which is now lawful wasn't? Here now I will lay down what I consider a general precept. I will name no woman in particular. I will leave the matter open for each of you to apply as he pleases. If any woman, not being married, had made her house open and available to the passions of all, and had openly established herself in the life of a harlot, and had been accustomed to frequent the banquets of men with whom she has no relationship, if she does so in the city, or in country houses, or even in that most frequented place, Baia, if in short she behaves in such a manner, not only by her gait, but by her style of dress, and by the people who are seen attending her, not only by the eager glances of her eyes and the freedom of her conversation, but also by embracing men, by kissing them at water parties, at sailing parties, and banquets, so as not only to seem a harlot, but a most very wanton and lascivious harlot, then I ask you, O Lucius Horanius, if a young man should happen to have slept with her, is he to be called an adulterer or a lover? Does he seem to be attacking chastity itself or merely satisfying his desires? I will ignore for the present all the injuries which you have done me, O Clodia. I banish away all recollection of my own distress. I put out of consideration your cruel conduct to my relations when I was absent. You are at liberty to suppose what I have just said was not about you. But I ask you yourself, since the accusers say that they derive the idea of these charges from you, and that they place yourself as a witness of their truth, I ask you honestly, if there be any woman of the sort which I have just described, a woman quite unlike you, a woman of the habits and profession of a harlot, does it appear an act of extraordinary baseness or extraordinary wickedness for a young man to have had some intimate connection with her? If you are not such a woman, and I would much rather believe that you aren't, then what is it that they impute to my client? If they try to make you out to be such a woman, then why need we fear such an accusation for ourselves if you confess it applies to you and despise it? So, give us a path and a plan for our defense, for either your modesty will supply us with the defense that nothing has been done by Marcus Caelius with any undue wantonness, or else your impudence will give both him and everyone else very great faculties for defending themselves.